All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Welcome back. Today's guest is my friend, Pamela Salzman. She is a chef and the author of Kitchen Matters and her new book, Quicker Than Quick. She is a mom and a really supportive friend and fellow female entrepreneur. But I'm going to take you back. I first heard of Pamela through her cooking class. She used to teach the super elite cooking class in someone's gorgeous kitchen on the West Side in the middle of the day. And I've had clients who didn't know how to cook and now share elaborate healthy recipes online. Pamela is the chef behind the chef. And I sadly was never able to attend. But had I known she was going to stop teaching in person, I would have moved things around for Pamela. So today, she's our guest and she's going to do a little podcast cooking class with lots of tips. So without further ado, Pamela, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So I have to ask, do you ever miss those cooking classes? You know, I still do a few. I used to teach four days a week, but then I felt like I couldn't do anything else. So I kind of reduced them to like twice a month. So I went from teaching like 16 a month to two a month. So I'm still in there because it's really what I love. I love interacting with people, um, but it's just not at the same rate. Yeah, definitely. And aren't you doing more online too? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the business has definitely shifted to more online just basically so that I could reach more people because I found that I was just teaching the same people over and over and over again. And there was never room to branch out and teach new people. And so I had groups that I'd been teaching for 10, 11, 9, whatever years. And they never let me go. So I'm like, okay, there's something wrong with this. Like I'm not reaching as many people as I could be. So that was the reason I actually started the online business. But all those women are now phenomenal chefs. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you'd like to think so. Yeah, they're all... They all have, have gotten their wigs, right? It's beautiful. So when you first started with them, what were some of um, some of the recipes that you taught them to make, or you know, what were the cooking techniques that you felt like any new chef needed to know how to make? You know, it's really interesting because I'm sure you've seen the same thing over the last decade, but a, there are a lot of new foods that have become more mainstream. So I remember back in whenever this was, like um, 2008 is when I first started teaching, is like nobody knew how to work with kale and quinoa. People didn't even know how to pronounce quinoa, let alone cook with it or eat it. And so... Quinoa, like quinoa, queen, queen, you know, you know it, right? So 
So back then, I was doing a lot with some of those ingredients. Like there was one supplier of almond flour. I don't know if you remember, but like it was Honeyville, right? So you could only order almond flour online with Honeyville. I mean, now you could get it in like practically 7 Eleven. But I was doing a lot with ingredients like that. And I was just starting to kind of teach people how to do gluten-free stuff. Like gluten-free was just starting to get more popular. And so it was more like those kind of things, like how to make swaps with more healthful fats. Like I was starting to teach with coconut oil and like how to use it. And um, it, now obviously that stuff's like, oh, everybody knows how to cook quinoa and everybody knows how to cook kale or eat it. And so it's really evolved from stuff back like like that kind of thing. Wow. So but it was also it was also just teaching people basics. I mean, people that came to my classes, they were just trying to feed their families, right? So I mean, in terms of like actual recipes, it was like people just were starting to get more into like healthy cooking. And they just wanted to know how to work with like healthy ingredients. I mean, just in general. Right. So when it comes to like say for example, we were start starting a cooking class right here online. And I've never cooked anything. What do you think is like the most important thing for a home chef to learn how to do? I think you have to start really simple. And you have to think about the foods that you actually like to eat. But there are certain kind of what I call template recipes that I think are really important to master. If you eat chicken, for example, learning how to roast a whole chicken is actually what much easier than people think. And it's one of those recipes that you never get tired of and that you could build on. Meaning like once you know how to do a basic roast chicken, you could start using different herbs and spices and stuffing different things into the cavity or roasting different vegetables around it and you can riff on it. And so that's the kind of recipe I'm trying to teach people is like the riffable ones. Um, also, something that I always tell people I think is great to start off with is knowing how to roast vegetables. Like just knowing the kind of the technique, you know, making sure that all the pieces are uniform as much as possible, making sure that your veggies are in one layer so that they caramelize and they don't steam each other, knowing the proper temperature and the fats to cook with. And then if you're cooking multiple sheet pans of them, knowing that they need to be spread apart a bit. So again, they don't steam each other or learning how to use your convection setting in the oven so that everything gets you know, again, like caramelized. So roasting vegetables is something that it's not always intuitive to everybody, you know, all those little tips. And then salad dressing. Um, it's really difficult. I mean, maybe it's not as difficult as it used to be, but it's like the one thing that I've always told people, like if you have to make one thing from scratch, it should be salad dressing because it's pretty difficult to find a salad dressing that uses high quality oil. You know, no, it took them, for, it took forever, and I'm sure when you first started, I mean, primal kitchen wasn't around. Didn't like, exist. It didn't exist. Yeah, it didn't exist. So it's like, and like you know the importance of health, healthy fats and oils, and so it's something that people don't think about. You know, they're buying this um, salad dressing, and they don't see any preservatives in it, and so they think it's good, and then they don't realize that the oil is refined or it's blended and mostly with canola oil and you know stuff like that. So just learning like basics of good salad dressings and building up the salad I think is also really important. Okay, so now I now I have to I want to go even deeper cuz mm. that roasted vegetable thing hits home for me in that sometimes they're they're I think they're delicious and then sometimes I'm like, mm, it's just not restaurant quality. What am I doing wrong?" And I think you've already named a few things. I mean, for the most part, uniform size pieces that's something I've, I've known for a long time. One layer, that's something I've known for a long time. But is there a specific oil or temperature you find is like that sweet spot for the perfect caramelized roasted vegetable? Yeah, I would say there's a good default temperature. So like if you don't want to refer to a recipe because you don't need to right. when you're roasting vegetables, I think 400 is a good default temperature. 375 can be okay too. The higher the moisture content of the vegetable the higher the temperature it is better because it will help caramelize it better. Mm -hmm. But again, 400 is really like a good place to start. That said, not every oil is great at 400 degrees. Um, mm -hmm. Avocado oil was something that also wasn't really mainstream. Like even 
six years ago, let alone 10 years ago. Yeah. So avocado has a pretty good smoke point. And there's also a, a good brand that does more of a steam refining as opposed to chemical and high heat refining, which is a chosen food. So that's pretty much like the only refined oil that I recommend. And you also have to think to yourself, and maybe it just comes with playing around, but does this particular vegetable taste good with something like a coconut oil? Not everything right. does, but some do. Like especially some of like the root veggies, the winter squash, the sweet potatoes, carrots, cauliflower. Like I think they taste really good with coconut oil, which is a more stable, saturated mm-hmm. fat, better for higher heat cooking because it doesn't oxidize, it doesn't break down. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think that the coconut oil is like a, like a curry on a cauliflower with coconut oil is delicious. And like a cinnamon or nutmeg with roasted root veggies and coconut yeah. oil is delicious. But totally. if it's broccoli, Chris is like, why am I eating Hawaiian <laughs> tropic stuff? <sunscreen?" laughs> I know, totally. Sorry, babe. I apologize. (laughs) But you know, it's really funny because I mean, different people will tolerate it differently, right? I mean, so some people will cook their eggs in coconut oil and I'm like, yeah, no. Gross. Um, Yeah, not And like Italian food, coconut oil. Yeah, no. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'll even use avocado oil on... I mean, I'll use it almost everything, but olive oil. There is some data though now um, that has shown that the olive oil, which isn't considered to be a higher smoke point, especially if it's an unrefined olive oil, is not breaking down at like 400 degrees in the oven the way people assumed it did. So it's it's you're still able to take advantage of the beneficial nutrients in olive oil. Yeah. So, so I actually have I actually saw that study and right. it is pretty interesting because it's just showing that there is still antioxidant content present even with the breakdown that is happening. So it isn't like as corrosive as people say it is. You know, Correct. I talked to certain functional MDs and they're like, never, never, you know, mm-hmm. and then others don't mind. It's I think it's a continually, continually evolving science. Um, but say for example, someone did want to use an olive oil with a higher heat, are you using a specific type of olive oil? like an extra light that it doesn't have as much olive content? Are you still using an EVO? Yeah. You know what? Here's the thing. I mean, and this is just my opinion, but I've really stuck by this the entire time. Um, I haven't changed my position on this is that I really always start with an unrefined olive oil. I'm not buying refined olive oils, even though the smoke point is is considered to be like higher. Mm -hmm. So because when you refine an olive oil and you, when you refine any oil you're using either a petroleum byproduct called hexane which is chemical mm-hmm. solvent or you're using higher heat or you're using both mm-hmm. and you're stripping away a lot of the beneficial nutrients that are present and so i would and then what what you're resulted with resulting with is just a bottle of free radicals and right. it's not good for you. So I'd rather damage my oil on my own terms than buy a bottle of already damaged oil. And so I try my best to keep it at medium on the stove. And then again, you know, in the oven, I'm usually not going above 375 or 400. That's such a good tip. I love that. I'd rather, I'd rather break down my own olive oil as well. <laughs> uh, so, so let's get, can you touch on that co- convection oven setting? Because yeah. my mom used to use that all the time when I was a kid and I like, will start the convection oven and then I'll switch to bake. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I'm cause you're so, cause like, you're feeling like you don't want to screw something up. Right. Yeah. I'm like, actually this is the night to test it. Cause I don't want to ruin anyone's food. <laughs> and when do you want to ruin food? Like never, right, ever, so, never. <laughs> yeah. So convection is something that I talk about in my classes like, all the time because people just are again, like a little bit intimidated about how to use it. So what it's really good for is distributing heat super evenly through out your oven via a fan, which pushes the heat again, like evenly throughout the oven, as opposed to a normal heating element, which just like you preheat your oven, it goes up. And then once your oven is at a certain temp, it stops, it stops heating the oven. And then your oven temperature drops by like five or 10 degrees. And then it goes on again. So it's like, it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. And then, but the convection setting, it's just like a constant pushing of the heat. So it's more even. And it's also faster. 
So the rule of thumb, if you want to use convection, and I'll tell you why you would want to use it, but the rule of thumb, if you want to use convection, is to drop your temperature by 25 degrees, and that will give you the same kind of cook time and cooking rate that if you would put it 25 degrees higher at a normal bake setting. So let's just say you wanted to roast your veggies and the recipe said 400 degrees. So you could type in convection and then you do 375, so 25 degrees less. Now, what's interesting now is that there are some smart ovens because um, you know I, I only teach in people's kitchens. So all I have to use is like normal like people's uh, appliances and stuff, not like a commercial kitchen. So I've used a couple of of smart ovens recently that actually drop the temperature for you. So the first time I did this, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so interesting. So I put in, you know, convection. I wanted it to be 375 because the recipe said 400. And so I put in 375 and then I pressed start and the oven converted it to 350. Wow. So if you have one of those ovens, you have to just know then you don't have to make that conversion for it. So why would you want to use convection? Well, convection is awesome when you're packing a lot of food into the oven at one time, especially high moisture food. So if you're doing like three chickens, three sheet pans of roasted veggies, or like some people have these extra wide ovens and you could do like side-by-side sheet pans and then fill up three racks and you've got six sheet pans. So if you've ever done that before, you know that it's really hard to caramelize vegetables when you've got a ton in there. Why? Because you start to get all the steaming. Right, right, right. Too much steam. And then the steam is like overwhelming your oven. Well, convection does a really good job of kind of drying up that excess moisture. So that's one reason to do it. So when you have a lot of high moisture foods in there, if you're kind of overloading your oven with a ton of stuff, like for example, like Thanksgiving, like I just keep that oven on convection the whole entire time. And some chefs love convection because again, it's like faster and they'll just always cook on convection. There's really no wrong time to use convection. The only thing that you can really do to mess it up is just, again, not acknowledging that rule of thumb of knocking it down by 25 degrees. And if your oven runs hot, because there are plenty of ovens out there that run hot, it's never a bad idea to check something early, like ever. (laughs) Especially if it's like your first time using convection. That's so interesting that you bring up the the temperature issues in ovens because I've been in the Chris and I have been in the same place for eight years and we got a whole new kitchen right before we moved in, which was awesome because I had all new appliances. But even in the last six months, I'm noticing that I'll cook things and the right side of my oven is you know, like I'll, I'll even like roast veggies or um, proteins or anything, and I'm noticing the right side of my sheet pans are always like more burnt or hotter. Is mm-hmm. that when it comes to like just maintenance of appliances and like making sure your knives are sharpened. Do you have a specific rule of thumb of making sure that everything in your house is sort of like... up? So you bring up like one of the best questions about cooking because what something that I realized very early on when I started to teach cooking classes, because again, I'm doing this in other people's homes. And so I, I was teaching the same recipe in every single home, okay, for like 16 times in a row in a month, right? Four times a week. And I would notice that the recipes would like, they would turn out differently sometimes because Mm -hmm. somebody's oven was hotter or it was slower. Or sometimes I would just have a different experience cooking these recipes because, you know, the kitchen wasn't well lit, the knives were dull, the, the, the counters were cluttered. Like, it, it was just... It, or, or the opposite. Like I would go into somebody's space and it was like, oh my God, this is bliss. Like I'm having a great time. It's easy. It's effortless. Right. And that's when I started to learn that it's not just about the skill level or the recipe and how well it's written. It's also about people's space and their equipment. So with respect to ovens, it's huge. Because it can really make a big difference. And I've noticed, like, I've gotten to know certain people's ovens, and like, I go in there and I'm like, all right, I know this person's oven is already super hot. I'm going to check whatever it is early. Or I know that it's got a hot spot in the back or on the bottom. I can't leave something on the bottom rack. And so I adjust. And I always say that to people because ovens are not something that you can just replace. Okay. It's not like, you know, ovens are like, 
thousands of dollars. So I just say like, you know, work with what you've got, work around the flaws, and then I'll get emails all the time. Like I'm changing my, you know, appliances in my kitchen. Like what's your favorite oven? I'm like, there, there isn't a perfect one. I mean, so I have this like really good Thermidor oven. It's not perfect. I right. teach with a lot of Wolf ovens. Like they're great, but they're not perfect. Even the same model can just be different from one to the next. So I think like, you know, like what you just said, like the right side's a little hot or the bottom's a little hot. So what does that mean? It means you have to rotate your pans. Or I think now would be a great time to try convection and see if that helps the cooking of you know everything more evenly than if you're just doing a regular bake setting. And if you want to just go into knives, same thing. Like people are always asking me like, which knives should I get? I don't like my knives. I'm like, your knives are actually awesome. You just need to sharpen them. <laughs> yeah. So the best knife is not... It's not like a $1,000 knife. You don't need a $1,000 knife. And you only need a few of them. You don't need like a whole set. I think that's such a waste of money to buy these like sets of 12 knives. But you just need like a decent knife that feels good in your hand. So like go to a cooking store and like Sir Latab lets you actually, they'll bring out some like carrots and celery and they'll let you chop stuff on a cutting block and see how it feels in your hand. Like some of them are going to be too big for you or they're going to be too heavy. You don't necessarily need to use the one that I like. It just feels good to me. But I do keep my knives sharp as can be because that is number one, going to help you cook more safely, more quickly, and more efficiently. And just your, your, your food actually will turn out better because you're not like bruising things and like you'll cut your onions and you won't cry. It's just such a game changer to have a sharp knife. Now, if you're trying to figure out like, Oh, where am I going to get them sharpened? Cutlery stores, like just Google cutlery stores in your area. Some cooking stores do it for you. Um, otherwise, the way I learned how to sharpen my own knives is the way I learned a lot of things is I went on YouTube. And I just, Perfect. Like, you know, I just like Googled, like, how do you sharpen your knives at home? I bought a whetstone, I have a honing steel, and like I sharpen them. And like now, like I got, I've been like kind of lazy. Like sometimes I do send them out and I get them sharpened professionally. But like, you know, during this time, like we're not going anywhere. So I've just been sharpening them at home and I, I do just as good a job. So it can be done and you don't necessarily need to um, you know, get the most expensive knives. Right. Well, we'll have to add your whetstone and your, your sharpening kit to the show notes and just oh, in yeah, case someone idea. wants that, uh, wants it to be their, their quarantine um, project you know, to do. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, let's, let's touch on proteins because I love... I'm definitely going to give um, convent convection roasting a try. Um, I'm not going to be as afraid of that button on my oven anymore. Um, and but I want to get into I want to get into proteins and some of your favorite mm-hmm. preparation um, techniques for those because I you mentioned a whole chicken. I think that's one of the easiest things and one of mm-hmm. the first things I learned how to cook because mm-hmm. I use a thermometer that just goes into the breast. I throw the thing in yep. <laughs> and it beeps at me when it hit the temperature that I want it to be at, which Love I tend it. to cook a lot with. Um, thermometers. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on thermometers? What proteins should we learn how to cook? And what do you think the basics are for making quicker than quick meals? In terms of using a thermometer, it's a total non-negotiable for me with bigger pieces of protein. So a whole chicken, a whole turkey, a tenderloin, um, even pieces of bone-in chicken breasts. Mm -hmm. There's no way... I mean, just going back to what we talked about, how all ovens are different, there's no way that you can know if a big piece of protein is cooked just by following a recipe. You may have started your recipe out with colder chicken than you should have, for example. Your oven might cook faster. I mean, there's other variables involved. I mean, when when a recipe says like, oh, you know... Cook this whole chicken for a hundred or at a four hundred twenty for an hour and ten minutes. Well, how big is that chicken? Is it three pounds? Is it five pounds? Did you remove it from the refrigerator an hour before you popped it in? So there's just no way that you can know for sure unless you put a thermometer in there. And you don't want to start hacking up a whole chicken to figure out if it's cooked in the middle, right? So I have a Therma pen by a company called Thermo Works. I don't know what kind you use, but it's an instant read and it's super reliable. And then I just have a backup, which is an OXO one that's you know kind of cheap. It's not an instant read. And it's really easy to 
figure out how to like just stick it in the thickest part. Don't hit the bone. Just pull it up a little bit if you hit the bone. And then just wait for it to get to 160 degrees, for example, for chicken. So I love using a meat thermometer for you know big pieces of protein. With respect to cooking protein and like the the types that I like to cook, I mean, we my husband is mostly plant based. Uh, my kids and I eat almost everything else. So we do do a lot of poultry. We do a lot of wild fish. I don't cook that much beef only because I don't actually like it that much. But I'm not opposed to you know good grass fed beef. The to me the key is just making sure the quality of the animal protein is high. There is a huge difference in terms of nutrition, in terms of anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory effects on the body when you're talking about something like a conventionally raised beef versus grass-fed. And then the same goes for farm-raised, like just salmon, for example, versus wild salmon. And they're not hard to find. I mean, it's not hard to find good quality. And so I'm not opposed to going to Costco and getting bags of wild halibut or wild um, Pacific cod. I think it's great. It's affordable and it's great. And you know, chicken, the same thing. You can get good pastured chicken at a farmer's market or at a local like natural food store. Um, grass-fed beef, I have actually found at Walmart. Plenty of different cuts of grass-fed beef. So it's it's accessible. Yes, it's slightly more expensive, but it's worth it. And I, I know you're a big protein person and you, you like to have a lot of protein at each meal. But if it's not affordable for you or it feels like it's too expensive to you know make that switch to a higher quality level of uh, protein, then just use a little bit less of it. Yeah, scale back. Scale back. Totally. Oh, yeah, totally. I'm on board for that. Yeah. So I, I mean, I cook protein so many different ways. I mean, I really like to mix it up. So, you know, I, we don't grill quite that much. Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm not going to say fearful. That's a bad word, but I, I don't love what I know about when animal protein comes into contact with high heat and create those heterocyclic amines, those HGAs. So it makes me a little, I don't know, apprehensive about doing it too much. And you certainly don't want to cook protein like super well done or char it because it does create these carcinogens. So something I love to do is I love to use my slow cooker. Um, Condensation is an amazing way to just reduce those carcinogens, you know, just like throw your chicken breast with some salsa and some spices in a slow cooker and like let it go. Um, I love to do fish in the oven. I love to do it in parchment. I like to make like soups and stews, um, you know, brown your chicken pieces and then some veggies, a little bit of broth and, you know, you've got a great stew. So there are so many different techniques that I use just to mix it up. Definitely. Well, I think that, I think that even just knowing that chicken in the slow cooker with salsa recipe is like a game changer for some people. It's like can get that simple where you just at the end of that, you're like, I can make tacos. I can, you know, put this over salad. I can have it shredded, you know, over anything really, which is those little, like, I think those techniques that people can learn are those short, little, small, really quick recipes or understanding how to use a thermometer, understanding a temperature for roasted veggies when they're not always having to reference a cookbook Mm -hmm. um, can be really um, empowering for people. Totally. And it just makes it a little bit less stressful. There's a lot of people that they just get stressed out about it. Um, And, you know, I mean, not to change the subject, but I think one of the things that is stressful for people is not having a plan. If you're not great at just coming home at six o'clock at night, seeing what you have in the fridge and being able to whip something up, most people can't do that. Uh, and, And I don't recommend trying to do that. So for me, what has been the biggest game changer in terms of my being able to cook regularly for my family, even though I work, work full time and I'm still like carpooling people at the end of the day and you know trying to just keep up with life, is having a meal plan. My mom did it. I've been doing it since I was in college, basically. I mean, I look at my calendar for the week and come up with a plan for what I'm going to make, what I feel like I can accomplish. Because what that does for me is it takes the stress off. 
And then I can actually go through my day without my brain being diverted at any point to what am I going to make for dinner? Should I call my husband and ask him what he wants? Should I have defrosted that chicken? And instead, you're able to focus more on everything else, like your work, like exercising, like being happy, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, just focusing on other things that come up during your day, as opposed to you having to use your brain for that dinner cloud hanging over your head. And it also just gives you the ability to be like flexible and just be like, oh, okay, so tonight, tomorrow, I know that I'm going to be doing a slow cooker recipe because that's in my plan. So I'm going to wake up in the morning and throw the chicken and the salsa in the slow cooker and go to work or go about my day. But if you are like at four o'clock in the afternoon, not knowing what you're making for dinner, slow cooker is not an option any longer. Right. So planning things out is to me, um, it's the biggest factor for in, in my book and a lot of for my my students as well in terms of being able to cook healthfully is just planning it out. It's it's so interesting that this podcast that we're taping this podcast during quarantine for mm. me personally because I've always done meal prep light where. But I have had the flexibility to do that because I live so close to a Whole Foods. I live in walking distance to a Whole Foods. Like, nice. It's closer to my house than the apartment complex next door. So it is ridiculously easy, but I still would shop for like three days at a time. And what quarantine has taught me is like, no, you have to actually make your decision for the entire week because we're going, going grocery shopping only once a week, which has been really interesting because I've had to think about mixing it up a little bit more, stocking mm -hmm. a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and it does. It does exactly what you said. It just makes you feel more calm and relaxed about what you have going on and not needing even that extra time to shop. And it's funny because I told this to Chris... Like I'm saving so many hours in the week, just like not running to Whole Foods. Well, it's so interesting that you say that because a lot of people will say to me when I'm when I tell them like the answer to their prayers is meal planning, not necessarily meal prep, meal no. planning. Yeah, and so I'm just like on a Saturday or a Sunday, just like sit down, just sit down and like think about what you want to make. And they're like, oh God, it takes so much time. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. When you devote, even if you devote a half an hour to it on a Saturday or Sunday, you will save yourself that time 10 during the week because you just keep thinking about it over and over and over again. And like you said, you're going to the market more times, like, you know, because you don't have that one ingredient or whatever. It is a game changer. So I think something that is maybe a silver lining that is coming out of this quarantine situation for a lot of people is that, number one, like having to plan a little bit, but also starting to learn to have a little bit more confidence in making swaps because we don't have all the ingredients sometimes to make something. And you're just like, okay, well... Let's see what happens. And oh my gosh, it turned out okay. And I like I did it. And so that's I think been really empowering for people too. Is just now like, oh my gosh, okay, so I can swap like, you know, pinto beans for black beans or sunflower seeds for walnuts or you know, this flower for this flower. And I think it's been really exciting. No, I'm definitely seeing everyone in their kitchens sharing recipes. And I've ha I even have two emails in my inbox right now that are one of those recipe share chains from two mm -hmm. different groups of friends. I mean, people are really looking for good quality content and they're looking, they're looking to get in their ki kitchen because they have time. You obviously spend a half hour meal planning. What and how do you organize and decide which recipes you're going to make for your family for the week? So... You know, it's it's a little different now than what it used to be because, like, you know what it's like when you're writing a book. You've got to like test recipes sometimes in your family. So I don't always follow like a traditional meal plan for the week. But what I used to do was I and I still have a binder. I have a binder of my favorite recipes, even if they're in cookbooks, even if they're in magazines. Like I created this binder that was like 
kind of like my favorite cookbook. So I would photocopy recipes from my favorite cookbooks because like it's so hard to remember where they are sometimes. And then I would organize them by category. And every time I found a new recipe that I liked, I would just like throw it in there in a plastic sleeve and organize it. And so then when I sat down to do my meal plan for the week, I would just take out the binder and I would also have a section on like, you know, to make um like for like inspo kind of a section like this looks good like you know for a day that you're willing to try something out and then i would look at my calendar and i'd be like okay so it's just uh, myself and the kids this night or my husband and i are going out so it's only the kids or you know it's a really really busy night or i'm working at this particular night and then i would just think to myself okay what can really be accomplished so if it's a night where i'm not there and it's just like my husband and the kids it needs to be something like super super dead simple that my husband can't screw up. Or it needs to be something that I made the night before and I could just like kind of cook once, eat twice sort of a thing where I like manipulate the leftovers. And then I just come up with my grocery list. But something that I'm also in- very, very into, especially these days is I look to see what I have. I, I am really big on like no food waste. So I look to see what I have in the fridge. Oh, like, okay, there's this eggplant that's been sitting around. It didn't get used. I better try and like find a recipe that can use the eggplant. Or, you know, I made um, X, Y, and Z and it, I threw it into the freezer and like, yeah, it's maybe it's time to like get that out and use it up. Or I have like a little bit of some. Uh, who knows, lentils in my basket in the pantry. Like, let me just use that up too. So I like to try and use stuff up so that number one, it doesn't go to waste. And then like things get rotated, right? So that's kind of my strategy. And I'm not super democratic with my family. I don't always like say, hey, like what does everybody want this week? (laughs) I'm sort of more like, I sort of dictate what we're going to eat. But it is... It's a technique that I think can be helpful for some um, for some like parents, just so that their kids can get on board with what they're making, and you know they can say like, okay, everybody pick one recipe. Like here's the binder. Like everybody picks one recipe, and then they can plug it into where it fits best in their week. That's a smart idea, actually, because I do have a big baby here. Chris literally is. He's a kids' meal kid. Like he likes mm-hmm. chicken parmesan. He likes mm-hmm. ribs. He likes a Cobb salad. Like it's a very short list of things that he loves and I love him for it, but it just, you know, it's pushing him to try new things and compromising when, you know, he doesn't want me to make anything quote unquote healthy. Yeah, um, I have the same hus- I have the same kind of husband. I mean, so. it's, same, it's like that comfort food, you know, um, and it's like a little bit limiting sometimes. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I'm, I I will push him when I can. You know, I'll mm-hmm. fifty fifty his white white basmati California rice with some cauliflower rice, and I'll make him a curry. You know, he was a cash, casserole kid, so just kind of like trying to make things that are baked, but also like healthy, like a zucchini style lasagna or something like that. You know, and sometimes he's like, eh, and sometimes he gets on board. I think it has to be strong enough flavors for him to get on board. But I like the idea of the binder. I'm sure there are... I have to look into it. I'm sure there are apps where you could store and build your own recipe box. Um, there's also a company called Real Plans that does that. Um, mm-hmm. But they have recipes that you can populate. It'd be interesting to get your all your recipes up on that um, platform because it's really, really cool. But speaking of your recipes, mm-hmm. I want to know some of your favorites because I'm really, really excited about the Quicker Than Quick new book. Um, what mm-hmm. What are some stars that are coming out of that out of your new book? And what are you most excited about? Um, Okay. So the book was really in response to my students and they were just asking me for quicker recipes. And, you know, I, I don't think that my recipes are complicated at all. Right. So they are pretty simple using like normal ingredients. And so I would say to them after class, I'm like, well, that was a pretty quick recipe. And they're like, well, you know, you started off with like a roasted sweet potato for these things. And like, that takes a really long time. And I'm like, okay. And so basically they wanted what somebody said. We will, If that was quick, then we need quicker than quick. I'm like, oh, okay, got it. So you need recipes where you don't have to have done anything in advance. Like you didn't have to make brown rice. You didn't have to roast a sweet potato. You didn't have to marinate something all day. Like you need to just like have a recipe where you get home 
and you can like start from ground zero and then work from there. So that's the idea behind this book. For a person who has some experience in the kitchen, like these recipes should all be 30 minutes or less. If if the person is just getting started in the kitchen, like yeah, maybe it would take them it could take them a little longer, but most of the recipes are really straightforward. One of the things that I think has been such a game-changing ingredient for me the last couple of years is riced vegetables. And I think like everybody's worked with cauliflower rice mm-hmm. before, whether they've like made it themselves or buy it frozen. It's a total staple in my freezer. Like I get the big giant Costco bags of cauliflower rice. I use it in so many different ways. But then I was thinking to myself like, okay, what's so awesome about cauliflower rice is that it cooks really fast. And you can add it to so many different things, whether it's like, you know, a smoothie or your oatmeal or just throwing it into rice or just using it instead of rice. Like, why can't we do that with other vegetables? So I started ricing like broccoli stems, sweet potatoes, carrots, zucchini. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this everything cooks so much more quickly. So I have these sweet potato patties that are in the book where you start with totally raw sweet potato and you just like pulse it up in your food processor until it's like as small as possible. And you mix it with like some almond flour and some eggs and some chipotle powder. It's like the simplest recipe. You form it into a patty. It doesn't have to refrigerate or anything like that. And then you cook it for a couple minutes on each side and they are killer delicious. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Yeah, you don't have to do anything ahead of time. And it's like... and, and, And like everybody can make it different you know, differently. If you don't want chipotle powder, you don't have to add it. If you want to add cumin or garam masala, like it doesn't matter. You can follow the recipe exactly. And then I made them the other day for my family and my son wanted like whole barbecue chicken on his and my husband had avocado on his and I had like pickled onion and I held cream cheese on mine. Like you can just sort of make them what you want. So that's, to me, like there's a lot of a bunch of recipes with like riced vegetables that I'm really into. Um, then there's a couple of instant pot recipes too. I just I couldn't help it with um, a book that's about quick cooking. But um, also some of the stir fries I think are great. And I think you know if you're trying to cook more quickly with respect to protein, you're not going to be using a whole chicken. Like I can tell you how to break down a whole chicken, but you know. I focused more on like the boneless, skinless pieces of protein, um, things that are cut more small. So like sheet pan dinners, with, whether it's chicken or even shrimp or um, you know pieces of fish, like bigger pieces of fish. Uh, so some of the sheet pan dinners I'm really excited about because they're really easy. And it's just also telling, t- teaching people that technique behind like, well, how can you change this up? So sheet pan dinners are really easy, but you have to know that, okay, so I've got some boneless, skinless chicken that's cut up into strips. That's going to cook in 18 minutes. I can't then put big pieces of like potato on there because that's not going to cook in 18 minutes. So it's just like learning how to adapt. Well, if you want to use potato, great. You got to start that a little early and then you could add your chicken after 20 minutes or something like that. So the sheet pan dinners, I'm like super excited about, but I'm also really excited for people that aren't eating animal protein. Like there's a lot of ways to adapt, whether it's with a cauliflower steak or using something like um, tempeh strips or, and I give a lot of examples on like how to, adapt different recipes if you're plant-based or whatever. Um, one of my favorites actually is this quicker chicken Marbella. So when I was... Um, I don't know if I was in college or something, but there was this recipe, this book that came out called The Silver Palette Cookbook. So I'm totally dating myself here, but it came out in like 1987 and everybody cooked from this book. It was one of the most popular books at the time. And you could not go to a dinner party without somebody serving this chicken Marbella. And it was really delicious, like chicken and like prunes and capers and olives. Um, and the recipe called for like so much brown sugar. It was like ridiculous. So <laughs> what I did you know, all these years later is like I took out all that brown sugar and I made it a quicker recipe than what it was, which was like marinating for 24 hours, bone in skin on chicken. And I made it so that you're using boneless, skinless chicken. You're doing it all on the stove. So 
it's it's just kind of also showing people like how to convert those types of recipes. So it's more like a lot of stovetop cooking because stovetop, even though it requires a little bit more hands-on time, is so much faster than oven. Yeah, it does, it definitely is a faster way to cook, and I'm and you're making your proteins and your veggies smaller, and sort of that stir fry effect, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting that that everyone was cooking out of the same cookbooks. I feel like you and maybe Danielle Walker, I cook out of all the same cookbooks too, but I have my favorite people. Just put it that way. <laughs> I think you've done and always done a really good job of of giving people the options to learn the swaps or understand how to manipulate one of your recipes. And that has to come from your cooking classes. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you have I mean you have obviously clients all over the world, but you know, you live in LA. So you understand kind of the demands that people make here. And when I first started teaching, I did not anticipate that that I would have to teach that way where people would come to every class and just be like, hey, you know what, we're gluten free now. I need to I need you to adopt that recipe to be gluten free. Or hey, like my husband is trying this new thing called the paleo diet or whole 30. And like I need these recipes to be compliant. And and so I'll tell you the truth, like in the beginning, I was like this is hard to have to mm-hmm. do this. But it was actually a gift that forced me to start to learn how to adapt the recipes and become more creative. And then it became more second nature. The more you did something, the more easy it was to you know then do it again. So I'm actually very grateful that I was pushed to learn how to do that because you know, people eat all different ways now. And and sometimes you're not even eating a different way, but maybe you're inviting somebody to dinner and they're gluten-free and you're just like, okay, now what? How do I do that? Right. So I really try to be super sensitive to, um, you know, everybody's different situations. Well, I think you always have been. And that's what's so, yeah. that's what's so Thanks. appealing uh, with, with all your cookbooks, really. Thanks. You know, even Kitchen Matters is just think like, that was so interesting. You'd, I'd open a book. To open your cookbook and see a recipe, and then have an additional instructions. It's like if you want to make it gluten free, if you want to make it vegan, if you want, to, you know, it's just yeah. like it's great. It's really it really is inclusive, and I think now more than ever we need we need that, especially in the food world. So, um, so cool. So a couple more questions, and then we'll get into where people can can snag um, can snag uh, both of your books and what you might have coming sure. up. First and foremost, obviously, there are a lot of people out there trying to not spend hours in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know you said your tips were cutting protein smaller, learning how to use your, you know, your maybe your convection oven, ricing vegetables, maybe going plant based. Right, do you have any other tips for people in this time to take care of themselves or anything that you're doing to take care of your family, not just for dinner, but maybe for breakfast and lunch too? You know, I mean, there's a couple of things that I think work for different types of people. Okay, so one thing that I have done like in the last couple of years that I never used to do is like I actually buy some what I call like prepared ingredients. Like I don't make every single thing from scratch because now we have a lot of companies that are making certain foods, certain products, like clean. They're in glass, they're organic, there's no preservatives. So I used to always make, like for example, marinara sauce from scratch. But now there's some products that are, again, like clean and they, they meet my requirements for you know something that's like healthy or whatever. So I think it's like, find those products that will help you out that you know, meet your standards for something that are that's like healthy, whether it's like a good quality tortilla or an enchilada sauce, or like I said, a marinara sauce or a salsa or, you know, an almond milk cream cheese. And like, don't be afraid to use those. Also seek out spice blends. So, and again, these are really easy to find clean with no preservatives or in glass or organic, you know, seek out spice blends that are already pre-mixed so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and figure out like, okay, I'm making salmon again. Like, how can I mix it up? Or how can I make it something that's just different and more exciting than just like coconut oil or avocado oil with salt and pepper and like a piece of lemon? And like instead, 
do your same technique, but maybe rub this different spice blend on it. There's a lot of different companies, whether it's like Primal Palette or um, you know, Penzi's has so many of these spice blends. And I was gonna ask what your favorites were. Yeah. So I mean, you can even get spice blends that are sausage seasoning. So I which I happen to love the flavor of sausage. Like I love that fennel and fennel, like, yeah. garlic. Yeah, I love it. And so sometimes I'll just like I have ground turkey in the freezer and I'll defrost it and I'll just like saute it up with some of the like sausage seasoning and it's so good and it tastes like sausage, right? right. But you have like the kind of turkey that you want and you have this like really clean seasoning. So I love, you know, prepared spice blends and like Thai curry paste. I would never make my own Thai curry paste, but I love Thai curry. So there's this brand called like May Ploy. You can get it in Asian markets, but you can also get it on Amazon. And I always have it in the freezer and it's just like so... Or not in the freezer, in the fridge. And it's so easy to like... When you have that template recipe, and I'm always trying to show people like what a template recipe is, whether it's a soup or a stir fry or a stew, like a Thai curry is just like a stew where you don't have to use those same vegetables. Like you can pull frozen vegetables out of the freezer and use the ones that you want, or you can swap in the vegetables that you have on hand and use those instead. And just that little bit of Thai curry paste is so flavor packed. And you can just... I mean, it tastes like a restaurant quality dish for very, very minimal effort. So I you know, look to recipes like that, recipes like um, just having that salad dressing on hand at the beginning of the week and then being able to pull together a salad with anything that you have. Like, I just don't think that anybody needs to follow a salad recipe per se. If you've got a good dressing, you take that and you can just like run with it. And then also looking if you don't eat pasta, and I don't really eat a lot of pasta, but like you can take a recipe for a pasta and make that whole sauce or veggie mixture or arabiata or whatever you want. And you can put it on something else, like for example, a spaghetti squash or, you know, like uh, even taking something like big chunks of roasted vegetables. Like there's nothing wrong with like pouring that mixture on top of like roasted veggies. So I think we just have to like think outside the box a little bit in that way. But it also doesn't hurt. And this is where some people start to like just tune out, but it doesn't hurt to do a little bit of meal prep at the beginning of the week. So I don't actually do meal prep in the sense that I know the recipes and I'm going to prep stuff for those particular recipes. But I do do certain amount of what I just call like ingredient prep at the beginning of the week that is just really helpful. Just take a little bit of the edge off. So I peel garlic at the beginning of the week because I use a ton of garlic and I keep it in a jar in the fridge. I always wash my salad greens and it just makes making that salad super easy. I always make the same dressing. I've been doing it for like 20 years and I always have a jar of it. And there are times that I use other salad dressings. Like I'll make something different. I'll throw something in a blender. But I always have that one that we all what really is it? like. It's yeah. called my everyday salad dressing number two. And it's just like two tablespoons of rice vinegar, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, a minced up shallot, like a little dollop of Dijon mustard, a drop of maple syrup, half a teaspoon of salt, a grind of black pepper, and then three quarters of a cup of olive oil. And you just put it in a jar and you shake it up and it's done. You can even freeze it. So a lot of times Delicious. what I'll do is like... And people don't even know you can freeze salad dressing. I didn't know. I'll make, yeah, you can put it in a jar... And you can just, I mean, be careful when you're putting jars in the freezer, but you know, you, I that actually you have a blog post. And, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, salad dressing is mostly olive oil, so it doesn't really expand that much, but just you know, kind of be careful. So, uh, you know, you can freeze it and then you have it for another time. But if there's something that you know that you use a lot of, uh, like greens, for example, like let's just say you love making kale every week or you have your Swiss chard, like wash it at the beginning of the week, like let it sit out to dry. And then when it's dry, like throw it into a clean bag and stick it in your refrigerator. There's just like little things that you can do again, just like sort of take the edge off. I love that. I, when I talk about meal prep light, that's all, that's all I do when I get back from the farmer's market. I just like I wash and like trim all my veggies so that I have sort of like a salad bar in the fridge. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. It makes it easier to roast my veggies if all the broccoli is all the same size at the beginning. We can go in the salad 100%. and go on the roasting tray. Okay, I love the garlic tip. Tell me a little bit more about cleaning your greens. You do not use a salad spinner. What do you do? I use a salad spinner if I need to, but otherwise, like I just fill up a sink, my sink with cold water, and then I dunk my greens in there and I wash them in there. If they're really dirty, I'll do it again. Or you can even do it under running water under the sink. It just you use less water if you have it in like a sink full of water. Mm-hmm. And then I lay them out on a kitchen towel and then I can just go about my business because I'm not in a rush. So when they seem to be like pretty dry, then I'll just stick them in a clean bag. I've got these bags called Nitos that I've had forever and you can just zip them up. And that's also how people in my family can differentiate between like what's clean in the fridge and what's not clean is if I have this sort of these bags that are just for clean produce. Um, but if I want to get it done right away, I'll use a salad spinner and I'll spin like my herbs. I, I also wash my herbs. So I'll just like wash my parsley, my cilantro, and I'll stick them in a clean bag. Um, because it's just those little things that I think can sort of make the difference. You know, it's like that extra five minutes or 10 minutes that can make the difference between you like saying, you know what, I can do this. Or you saying like, Ugh, I don't have time to do this. <laughs> right. 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 But I, so I, I've gone... One of the ways I learned the fact that like you can do this kind of thing is just being observant in a supermarket. Like walking through the produce aisle and just be like, huh, there's cut up butternut squash for sale. I guess that means that I can cut up my butternut squash in advance and let it sit in the fridge for a day or two. Or going in the freezer section to be like, it's so interesting that brown rice can be frozen. I guess that I can do that too. So that's one of the ways that I learned um, is just sort of seeing that this was in existence, you know? Right. Yeah, no, I'm definitely um, someone who has and continues to purchase Whole Foods frozen basmati rice and brown rice because it's just something that I don't make very often. But now with quarantine, I've made a couple of batches in my Instapot and frozen them. But I never... like What a dum-dum. I never would have thought to do that. I just was trying to make it easier for myself to like give Chris rice when he wanted it. But isn't that so interesting? Like what, how this quarantine is changing the way, you you know, you're approaching like cooking and prepping is like, now you're probably not going to spend the money to buy pre-made frozen basmati rice. Never. You know how like you can just do it so much more inexpensively at home and it's not that hard. I mean, so, you know, sometimes that I think this whole idea of meal prep can be a little bit overwhelming for people because they think that they're going to be in the kitchen all day just like cooking tons of stuff when it really is just more like, okay, well, if I'm going to make some rice right now, I might as well just make some salad dressing while the rice is cooking. And then since I got that done in five minutes, then the rice still has a few more minutes to go. Like, why don't I just see what I can do? Like, I'll give myself 15 extra minutes. Like, what can I do in 15 minutes? Well, I could probably chop some carrots and I could probably wash some lettuce. And and then sometimes you're just like, oh, gosh, well, this is cool. Like, maybe I'll just give myself another 15 minutes and see what I can get done. It doesn't have to be this like all day thing. Yeah, no, I think people feel jailed in their house on Sundays and that they need to be making like 12 chicken breasts in their oven and slicing it so that people can have the exact same lunch every day. And and I know that 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 is something that makes some people feel safe, but I think you lose the creativity. I love the idea of just like making things in bulk and storing and freezing them. Like just even you saying you're making rice, you're going to make the salad dressing while you're making the rice. It's like, you might as well use your rice cooker in a pot or your pot and make twice as much rice and freeze half of it and make twice as much salad dressing and freeze half of it. Because so many times if you just make one recipe, you've bought some some type of produce that you might not use unless you planned two recipes with the same amount of produce. Totally. Right? I'm yeah, totally. And I think it's different for different types of people. I mean like, you know, we're talking about rice. I mean if people are listening that don't cook rice, well, what do you want to use during the week? Like, what's your go-to? Like, what do you love to always have on hand? Is it chicken breast? Like, that's cool. So like, you know, make your chicken breast ahead of time. Like, do it in a slow cooker, do it in an instant pot, or, you know, make your grilled chicken and just like have it. I, I actually do make chicken at the beginning of the week for my son because he is super limited as to what he likes to eat. And like for school lunches, like he wants three meals, 
a week, he wants to have a salad with some sort of cooked chicken, whether it's poached or grilled or slow cooked, doesn't matter. So I always make it for him. And that just, again, just ensures that he's going to get a healthy lunch as opposed to like well, waking up in the morning and just be like, okay, now what? Hummus again? <laughs> yeah. Well, what a cutie that he likes salads. I love that. What a cutie that yeah, it's three days a week. <laughs> I mean, I, oh I my gosh, I think it's good that he's eating that's vegetables. Yeah, it's <laughs> totally true. Totally true. Uh, we, we might have bigger fish to fry if he wasn't. I'd love to know before we end what day in the life of you looks like. Um, for like a for normal weekday, I mean, you know, when I was teaching, it would just be, you know, wake up at 5.30 or 5.45. My son leaves pretty early. I have two kids that are out of the house now. So I have just my son at home and, um, you know, kind of get him out the door, go for a workout, come home, shower, load my car up, drive an hour to LA to somebody's house, you know, prep for an hour and a half for a class, teach a two hour class, come home, deal with emails, maybe start some recipe testing, maybe photograph something for the blog. And, um, you know, and, and just do that kind of work, like work on, you know, business stuff, cook dinner for my family, hopefully, maybe something was prepped on the weekend or something was like prepped in the morning, but like start dinner for my family. And I'll be honest with you, a couple of years ago, I was at a place in my life where I would have dinner and then I would get back on the computer. And I would get back on the computer until my husband would call me from upstairs and be like, it's 11 o'clock. Are you coming up to bed? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be right there. And something happened recently where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I cannot... I can't be on my computer working and you know, trying to catch up with social media and everything else until it's time to go to sleep. So I decided that I would have to just work a little bit smarter. And when dinner was over, like that was it, done. I needed to have a little bit more balance in my life and spend a little more time with my husband, whether it was like going back to the old days of just watching a show on TV or reading or just connecting or taking the dog for a walk at night or something like that. So that's been kind of my new, newer normal is just not, it's just again, having a little bit more balance and just trying to cut the work off at a certain point. I mean, you're an entrepreneur, you have your own business. It, it is possible for me to work. 48 hours in a day if I wanted to. Yeah. And the way our the way our lives are and the way technology is, um, you know, you could be trying to catch up on social and responding to people's DMs or writing or um, you know, I could recipe test all day long. Um, and but for somebody that's trying to promote a healthy life, um, and and I didn't have that balance. I was like, there's something wrong with this picture. So so that's kind of like the way my life is now. I mean, I love what I do. And I'm so, so committed to helping as many people as possible be their healthiest selves through cooking, you know, in a in a healthy way. Um, but I also have to kind of walk the talk myself. Yes. It's a really it's a really like deep line you have to draw in the sand as an entrepreneur because you can easily get sucked into the work that you create because you've created the whole work. You know, you've created your whole job and your whole business out of thin air. You created it. You put the work in. So it's like the more work you put into it, the bigger and greater it may become, but it also is at the expense of your own health and your relationships. So it's one of the hardest things I think as entrepreneurs we have to do. Yeah, that's exactly right. So really I think beautiful. we all come to that on our on our own. And you know, and I think in the last couple of years, what I've realized is that, you know, like I had to think about it. Um, like what, you know, what are we all doing anything for? Like what is life really about? And like I, I really do believe that life is about love. And so I decided that my decisions would have to come from a place of love. Like whether it's 
love for myself or love for somebody else. And when I would start to make decisions out of love, that's when I made those changes. Like that doesn't, that's not loving myself. That's not being compassionate for myself. So, and then I think people can also take that and when, and they can apply it to food choices too. Like, should I make that choice? Well, is it, is it coming from a place of love for myself if I make that choice? And I think it kind of, it changes the way at least I've looked at things. I think you just answered the last question of every podcast, which is what does body love mean to you? (laughs) I guess I did. (laughs) Yeah, I guess I did. Um, it's, You know, I feel like as I've gotten older, I've really needed to have more compassion for myself because, you know, you can get to that place where you feel like whether it's just in your own life, like I'm not doing enough. I'm like, you know, why didn't I push my... Why am I not pushing myself harder? Why haven't I gotten here yet? Or even like, why did I just eat that? Or why why am I not... uh, Why am I not... Doing things more healthy, more healthfully, or you know, how could I have not known that um, is so much healthier for me than X, Y, or Z? And so I've really come, I've really grown a lot um, over the last couple of years, and just really again appreciating, you know, who I am, what I know, and again, like really having so much more compassion for myself and so much more forgiveness and allowing myself to do the best that I can and accepting that that is good enough. That was beautiful. I really do feel like what comes of that is balance. Like that compassion that you give yourself and really just being from being in a place where when you know better you do better but you're going to be compassionate pa- compassionate with yourself and forgiving of yourself instead of beating yourself up is is really where i see so many of my clients and so many other female entrepreneurs and women like really feel at home in their bodies and and feel balanced in life it's really beautiful okay. pamela thank you so much thank for you. sharing thank you and thank you for all that you do well, it's so it's coming from a place of love, just like you, sister. So, <laughs> so it's good. I'm so excited for this podcast to come out. I mean, even like from the convection oven to like having the right temperature and, and using specific oils. I mean, I'm really excited to dive into your new book and learn all the different templates there are. Um, those are the kind of everyday recipes I think everyone needs. Those I, you know, I'm a big fan of a template with the Fab Four smoothie. So I appreciate yeah, that's that. Right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Exactly. It's kind of like that. Exactly like that. So now I need to dive into your book and learn all the other templates so that I can start cooking just like you. Uh, Pamela, can you tell everyone where they can follow along online and what they can expect to see from you and where they can buy your books? Yeah, totally. So I'm really easy to find. I'm my website is PamelaSalzman.com. I'm on Instagram at Pamela Salzman. Oh, it's been really fun actually. I have done an Instagram live every single day since March 16th. So we're going on several weeks now and I'm still doing them, just doing live cooking demonstrations or you know, ask me anything or whatever. So that's been kind of fun. I if you go to my website, you can find my online cooking classes on there. If people want to take classes with me. And my books are wherever fine books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you know, all the, the normal places. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much for being here. I'm excited to share all your information. I'm going to be sending you a long email because I have a number of, of things I'm going to have to get from you from mm-hmm. your thermometer to your, to your favorite... Um, dressing and all the rest. But um, I really appreciate your time. And you guys check out the show notes for the details on this podcast. I know there's a lot of knowledge dropped by Pamela. So see you guys all next time. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 